Hello everyone. Today we will be discussing the origins and implications of Brexit and this PowerPoint will help serve as a guide for this particular lesson plan. This lesson plan will cover a good portion of Brexit's important details, details such as Euroscepticism, the origins of the Brexit vote, why the vote leave, vote leave camp won, what happens next, and what it all means for Canada's relationship with the EU and our closest European ally, the UK, including ampl implications for the Comprehensive Economic and Treaty Agreement and Canadian society in general. To begin, we will start by identifying the underlying concept that will help us understand why the UK would want to leave the EU in the first place, and that concept being Euroscepticism. Before understanding Brexit, having a solid background knowledge on Euroscepticism will really help with critical thinking and help you formulate your own ideas as we go through the lesson. And with that, I will go right into the next slides. Euroscepticism, as the name suggests, is a European political doctrine that advocates disengagement and disintegration from the European Union, the very idea that the European Economic Community and today the European Union was built on. Eurosceptic political parties can be classified as hard Eurosceptics, those that express complete opposition to European integration, and soft Eurosceptics, those that are conditionally in favor of European integration but qualify such support um, along political, ideological, ethnic, or geographical lines. Um, and just quickly glancing over, um, Eurosceptic viewpoints have actually existed since the start of European integration following the Second World War, and even countries like the United Kingdom were not actually in favor of giving up their sovereign powers to an overarching body until the year 1973, almost two decades after the first integration efforts were seen in Europe. Supranational organizations such as the European Coal and Steel Community provided the template for the European Economic Community, a free trade bloc created by the Treaty of Rome in 1957. Over subsequent decades, the membership of the EEC doubled to 12 countries and trade within the custom unions increased dramatically. As the years went on, the EEC countries who favored cooperation kept on cooperating. Eventually, the UK was given membership in 1973 after over a decade of talks and political stunts. As integration in the EU deepened, the EU underwent multiple crises that hurt a lot of member states, some extremely disproportionately. Crises like the Europe Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis, and other events have fueled anti-EU sentiments. As stated earlier, in the early days of the Economic Union, the UK was not interested in giving up its power in order to create a balanced economic power. Instead of joining the original sex members of the European Economic Community, Britain instead opted to join the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, OEEC, in 1961 and work towards the reduction of trade restrictions between its members. Even at this time, Britain was suspicious of the European Economic Community and its supranational nature. However, the UK's non-participation meant that when it did join the EEC in 1973, it had to accept many elements controversial among some British voters which were established before it joined its supranationalism, the common agri agricultural policy in the EU, as well as the budget for the European Union. The steady progression toward the creation of a single organization to govern uh, European security, ec economy, and social policy uh, was checked abruptly in June 1992 when voters in Denmark rejected the ratification of the Maastricht Treaty, the founding document of the EU. So Euroscepticism is, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, we have seen it within the EU as well. Um, and although we have hinted um, as to what explains uh, the EU's particular um, Euroscepticism and why um, they may exist, uh, we will exp explore them more thoroughly in the following slides. A number of factors explain the UK's natural feeling of skepticism towards the EU. For one, politics has played a massive role with the two biggest parties split on the matter of Brexit. Tory, on the one hand, a conservative party, shared more Brexit sentiments than Labour, who wanted to cooperate in the multilateral system and stay as an EU member. Outside of the official discourse, propaganda and flimsy reporting were huge in the Leave Camp's ability to win, mobilizing a huge group of people and spreading fear and disinformation. 
As we have demonstrated, the UK does not see itself to be the same as the rest of Europe, and this has heavily affected its relationship with the rest of the European Union and ultimately the end of its relationship. Historically, the UK has an attachment to the Commonwealth and of its former empire. The UK also shares a close bond with the US and has an attachment to its parliamentary sovereignty, which have naturally hindered its relationship with the EU. Because membership in the, into the EU didn't seem to show much tangible benefits for a country like the United Kingdom, the UK has decided that the cons outweigh the positive uh, in some camps. Now we will take a look at the history of the United Kingdom in European integration. Um, so in 1961 and 1967, the United Kingdom's application to join the European communities was vetoed twice uh, by French President de Gaulle. Um, but in 1973, the UK was given membership along with Denmark and Ireland. So they officially became members of the Economic Union. Uh, in 1975, a referendum on leaving the communities was won by the Remain side at 67%. Um, and starting in the 1980s, um, in the mid, early to mid-1980s, um, Prime Minister Thatcher supported reforms to the single market, essentially completing um, that integration project. But then later in the 80s, um, decided that further European integration uh, was not the move and decided to stop supporting further integration and opted out of the Economic Monetary Union in the Maastricht Treaty. The United Kingdom Independence Party is a Eurosceptic uh, right-wing populist political party um, and was at the forefront uh, in the fight for leaving the EU. And in 1999, uh, they made strides by winning three seats in the European Parliament. And in 2014, they became the largest British party in the European Parliament. Um, and in 2015, um, you can see uh, the influence that they have when da David Cam when Prime Minister David Cameron promised um, an in-and-out referendum on a new settlement with the EU if he's re-elected um, and unexpectedly wins a majority. Um, and uh, after that, we see uh, the emergence of EU, and we will go through um, the process of uh, Brexit as well in the following slides. Now that we have a history of Euroscepticism, along with details about its origin and operation, it is then time to apply it to the situation at hand, which is Brexit. When going through this section with a class, devote at least 25 minutes of teaching, followed by the handouts which contain questions for the students to answer. There were a number of factors that accounted for Brexit. First, most people from the UK lack a European feeling because to them, their British identity comes first. We have already established why this feeling already exists and why these anti-EU anti sentiments already exist. Second, Britain's history with the EU and Europe has been unique and it may help explain aspects of Brexit and deep-rooted negativity to towards the European project, especially among older populations who have seen these things happen. Third, the political landscape of Europe and surrounding regions has changed drastically in the last 10 years. The EU has been slow to respond, and this has fueled anti-EU sentiments from the UK. And fourth, policy attitudes towards EU. The UK does not want to be struck down to this mode of policy and having to rely on the EU to make um, have jurisdiction on some of its laws over theirs. And next, here I have just compiled um, some of the main arguments uh, from both camps, from both Leave and Remain, from Hobolt's uh, The Brexit Vote, A Divided Nation, A Divided Continent. Um, starting with Leave, um, these are the things that I thought were the most um, important to note. Lack of trust, security imp implications, cost of membership, no faith in elected officials, and immigration control. So these are the most; these were seen as the most pressing concerns uh, for people in the Leave camp: um, lack of trust in the government, security imp implications in terms of uh, migration, cost of membership in terms of the UK's contribution in terms of the budget, no faith in elected officials. Um, the, you know the anti-EU sentiments uh, springing from there, and of course immigration control. And on the other side, uh, the Remain camp. Um, 
they wanted to stay because they were mainly com concerned about economic stability and the economic benefits that come uh, from being a member of the uh, European Union. As well, at the same time, they wanted to avoid economic disaster and maintain uh, the current order at the time. If we look at the EU referendum results, we can see from the demographics that the results were extremely close, indicating that even though they lost EU membership, almost half of the 70% of the population that voted wanted to remain in the EU. So although they lost EU membership, a good chunk of the population would still like it. We can also see that voter turnouts were high, indicating that this was a pressing concern for the people in the United Kingdom. Now we can look at the data and identify the voters and the demographics that surround them. According to the data, younger voters were much more likely to vote remain than older voters. However, at the same time, turnout in areas with a higher proportion of younger residents tended to be much lower. In the same vein, people over the age of 45 were much more likely to vote leave. What else this data suggests is that people with less educational background had a much higher chance of voting for leave and people identifying as English unequivocally um, choose to leave almost 100% of the time. An analysis of the campaign reveals that leave was, able, was successful in setting the agenda on things like immigration and economy, while things like sovereignty and taking back control and security uh, relating to terrorism and the cost of membership and other issues related to democracy and whatnot were marginal issues. A lot of the time, um, essentially the role of leave groups um, started to play a big role as well. Um, the Eurosceptic leave groups, Vote Leave, Leave.eu, and Grassroots Out focused heavily on mobilizing on pu public anxiety over things like immigration, EU free movement, and further EU enlargement to Central and Eastern Europe, as well as places like Turkey, who have had suspended membership for years, and essentially these were unfounded claims uh, in an attempt to scare the UK people. To add further context, there is a timeline of Brexit and the events that have gone on and what could have gone on and what didn't. So on 2016, the UK voted to leave the EU all the way down to October 2018. The Brexit ne negotiations began between the UK and the EU to uh, draft a deal that would uh, bring the UK back uh, to ratify uh, the UK back into the EU. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case and the UK was expected to leave the EU in 2019 and officially left uh, the European Union. The final section will go into the implications of Brexit. Since Brexit is behind us now, it is now time to look at how the UK's decision implicates its ability in the international arena as well as with its neighbors. Around 20 to 25 minutes can be dedicated to this part of the lesson. The grand gesture of the United Kingdom leaving the European Union has essentially exacerbated um, the disintegration, euphoria, and the idea of being free. And uh, this idea subtly spread to some parts of the EU, and these sentiments still do exist in little amounts. Um, after the departure of the EU, of the UK, sorry. There have been rumblings about disintegration among member states. However, it's also important to note that the difficulties faced by the UK while attempting to leave the EU most likely discouraged the others from wanting to face the same thing. Another implication for the EU is it loses one of its major players. It will have effects economically as the EU will not receive any funds from the UK. Politically, there are implications as well especially in the Council and the European Parliament, which will have different dynamics once one of the biggest members, Euro United Kingdom, left. Goods traded between the UK and the EU are subject to the requirements that are, not, that are normally imposed on goods from third countries, along with checks prior to important for compliance with these requirements. 
These requirements include customs, value-added tax, and of course this is an ideal for the European Union who emphasizes free trade and collaboration, but this is a reality that is being faced. Brexit will also have implications in Canada as well. As the UK was no, is no longer a part of the European Union, the Canada-UK trade relationship is no longer governed by the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or shortened CETA. However, a year ago, Canada and the UK signed a new agreement with mishaps along the way, but nothing impeding cooperation with a full agreement in place now. However, in Canada, Brexit could open the door uh, to more than the economic troubles uh, discussed above. More than just about trade, this is extremely relevant to Canada because if the United Kingdom, the country on which Canada's constitution and parliamentary system is loosely or largely based off of, cannot manage its political system, what does this imply for Canadian parliamentary democracy? Especially considering the current situation that Canada finds itself in and Quebec's history with referendums. Although there is no credible evidence that Canada is in immediate danger of disintegration or separation, calls for separation have happened before, and it is not impossible that they show up again, and it is extremely relevant in this case to learn about these subjects and have a more complete understanding of them. To finish off, thank you for listening to this presentation, and I would just like to ask a few questions to conceptualize the lesson before we finish. First, when are referendums legitimate and when are they not? Did you get the feeling that this referendum was legitimate? What factors do you believe would constitute it to be not legitimate? And which factors would constitute it to be legitimate? What parallels does Brexit hold with the 1995 Quebec referendum? What connections can be made between the two? What differences can be made between the two? I highly recommend you to go back and look at the slides once more and then refer to the 1995 Quebec referendum and see what you can see for yourself. And finally, I would like to ask and conceptualize the idea of whether separatism, especially given the, the context of the Quebec referendum and the quest to separate, is this possible and given the underlying factors that have contributed to Brexit and what we have discussed today in this lesson, is a separatism movement possible to start in Canada? This is another question that future research should analyze and future should look into.